11th Street Forum is being held in Xiamen, Fujian Province in southeast China with a record number of more than 10,000 people from Taiwan attending, despite obstruction efforts by the DPP administration. As the largest annual event across the Taiwan Street, the Streets Forum aims to promote economic exchanges and cultural integration between the two sides. So what new insights and perspectives are presented this year around? And how will cross-street relations move forward with internal challenges and external pressures facing both sides? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the Beijing studio by Dr. Zhong Hou Tao, Research Fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and He Jing, Attorney with Anjie Law Firm. We will also talk of our satellite with Professor Yu Ping Zheng from Taipei University. That's our topic. This is the dialogue. I'm Yang Rui. Welcome to our discussion here um, with regard to this uh, most important annual non governmental uh, platform or event across the Taiwan Street, uh, Dr. Zhong. Are there any new aspects that need to be emphasized, particularly this time around? Yes, and there are several new aspects for this uh, annual conference. The first point is that it emphasizes the new world uh, grassroots. Uh, as for this time, we invited more than 10,000 Taiwanese people from Taiwan to participate in this conference, and re this reached the highest record in the past 11 years. And more than uh, 80 uh, sponsors uh, support this conference, and this also reached the highest number. And the second is we highlighted the uh, Ec uh, economic tra uh, exchanges and uh, the two sides signed more than 20 agreements and we have reached a lot in this area. The third point we emphasize on the cultural communication. For example, we hold some uh, many sub forums on the uh, family name, on the religious belief and some other cultural uh, aspects. So I think this uh, has already become the biggest non-official platform between the two sides and it will continue to play a very important role in cross-trade relations in the uh, future. Mr. He Jing, without exceptions, uh, audiences and viewers alike would pay particular attention to messages that must have been delivered by the keynote speaker at the opening ceremony of this forum, the 11th of its kind since its inception. So what do you think of the uh, importance of uh, the uh, goodwill gestures that the mainland or Chinese mainland authorities deliver? Uh, to me, I think the most important thing is that uh, I think the mainland China really communicates a real and genuine message to build their authentic communication or relationship with uh, the people in Taiwan. To have these two sides to really have the better understanding or fully appreciate or eventually build a partnership this kind of a communication or this kind of platform will really prove to be very, very important. So as we heard that there are 10,000 people coming you know, from Taiwan and coming to this uh, forum. This has created a lot of great opportunities. But uh, going beyond that, I think the more, a lot more work needs to be done. So right now the trade part is really great. But uh, the kind of real partnership going beyond the buy and the sell relationship, you really have the both sides to have a much, much deeper compassion or ideally build something together. It comes as no surprise that the two guest speakers in the Beijing studio uh, gave us a, a more comfortable picture about either the realities or uh, future of the cross relations. But I li I'd like to go to uh, Mr. Zheng uh, a uh, scholar from the Taipei University, uh, Zheng Youping. Uh, I'd like to have your thoughts on uh, some of the unpredictability uh, or elements of uncertainty in the current uh, cross street relations, uh, despite the positive implications that, that the two uh, guest speakers addressed uh, just now. I'd like to have your uh, more precise depiction of some of the things that should upset this side, the Chinese mainland. Well, first of all, the Straits Forum, uh, when it began over a decade ago, uh, wasn't new to everybody in Taiwan. It wasn't that famous. But thanks to DPP's propaganda against this foreign, DPP uh, described the Straits Foreign as a form of uh, conspiracy. It's a united front tactics 
against the Taiwanese. So DPP warns against everybody not to join, not to go to the Straits Forum. However, because of that, people are beginning to pay attention to this forum. And because of its nature of inclusiveness, its social, multifunctional exchange platform, people began to realize that <coughs> this forum actually is very useful. I myself had the pleasure of uh, taking part in one of the forums, uh, I guess, five or six years ago. And I realized that thousands of Taiwanese flock to this forum because they feel that it's very useful. You get to know people, you get to see different kind of exchange opportunities. And of course, for business people, they will think that building up the uh, contacts uh, there in mainland China is extremely useful for them. And nowadays, more and more young generation, younger generation, especially, especially the college students, are interested in joining this forum because in coming to this forum, they feel that they have been able to expose themselves to the wider network that are presented in this forum, which means a lot more opportunities. I think it's very nice, but I have to say that the DPP are very nervous about this, and they even warn against whoever goes to this forum that they might be in a potential violation of uh, the current existing regulations governing uh, the cross trade exchanges. And they warn that if you dare to go, we might levy a, a heavy uh, a penalty on any one of those that we deem uh, who have violated uh, the law. So I have to say that because of DPP's opposition, this forum actually demonstrated a very useful line of communication across the straits. And let's it's non-political. Uh, Professor Zheng, let's look at what's behind the attitude of DPP regarding the annual forum. Do you think their opposition is more about anger or jealousy? Because uh, uh, a few in the mainland uh, would doubt their wishes to have some kind of dialogue with uh, the Communist Party of China in the Chinese mainland. But because of uh, Madame Tsai Ing-wen's refusal and defiance to accept the 1992 consensus and the One China principle, uh, the groundwork for such a dialogue has been seriously damaged. But it doesn't mean that the DPP refused from the very beginning to have any forms of talk with the Chinese mainland. You, you know what I mean. Um, a second question, if you like. I know. Do you think uh, mm -hmm. KMT participants from Taiwan mm -hmm. would face punishment of different kinds once they go back to the, uh, the island after finishing the participation? Let me take up the second question first. I don't think DPP would have the guts that make them dare to punish whoever took part in this forum, especially the KMT members. And if they did that, I would have to say they're helping the KMT to gain more popularity uh, among the Taiwanese voters. Now, coming back to your first question, why would DPP be so much against this Straits Forum? First of all, I would say it's fear, it's anxiety, it's a lack of the sense of security because they realize that after witnessing a decade of exchanges in this forum, they have seen an increasing level, though very slowly, of cultural identity and national identity with the mainland China. In other words, they would like to cut off all forms of communication and exchanges across the straits because that's exactly what they're afraid of. The more contact, the more exchanges you have in this kind of non-political forum, you're going to see people becoming more and more integrated. People will merge together and they will come to realize that we are actually both from the same family. So that's why DPP's anxiety uh, his, their, their lack of uh, sense of security and their anger all originates in the successfulness of this forum. And I have to say, the more successful this forum becomes, it also means 
that people will come to realize that a lot of the things that DPP tell them are actually lies, outright lies. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zhang. Dr. Zhang, we believe many observers in Taiwan must follow the development of recent events in Hong Kong. Yes. For example, Mr. Han Guoyu, a strong yes. candidate for the major election one year from now, yes. said he would never accept the one, one country, two systems mm -hmm. policy, mm -hmm. a policy that has been successfully applied in Hong Kong since 1997. Yes. Um, what do you think of their worries shared by both DPP and the KMT following the turbulence in Hong Kong? Uh, I think that is just a pretext. The main aim for DPP is just to block any exchanges between the two sides. As for the DPP, uh, as for the KMT, I think uh, even for Han Guiyu, they uh, don't want to be reunified with the Chinese mainland. To some extent, they just want to maintain their autonomy, uh, just to extend some of their, to, uh, as a special region, or to maintain uh, they have their special uh, rights to vote for their... But I'm I'm afraid, Dr. Zhong, there are some uh, shades of differences between what Ma ying stood for and what uh, Han Guoyu uh, said in terms of the cross relations, uh, such as uh, one channel with different interpretations mm -hmm. or one channel with the same interpretation. Uh, do, do you think in this regard that Han Guoyu uh, keeps a careful distance from Ma ying and his successor in the Central Committee of the KMT? There are both similarity and differences between Ma ying and Han Guoyu. As for Ma ying no, re no reunification, no independence, and no use of force is his famous slogan. But for Han Guoyu, he just want to emphasize the two sides should exchange with each other, should do more economic communication. That, is, that will bring benefit for Taiwan people. Uh, and as for Han Guoyu, he uh, does not oppose, or at least publicly oppose reunification. That is a great uh, difference between him and uh, KMT and even for Ma ying And I think for that, he would attract more more supporter from the deep uh, blue camp. Many in the Chinese mainland, uh, Mr. He, expressed the same concern that uh, the recent uh, turbulent events in Hong Kong might be a wake-up call uh, for our vision on the cross-street uh, unification, reunification, so to speak. Uh, what do you think of the ramifications? Well, I think people take positions politicians take positions. Wh whatever happened in Hong Kong or somewhere else, people actually take those as a justification for the positions they're already having. So the position, the kind of positions like even Han Guoyu or, or TPP, the politicians, they, they have to take this kind of position to survive or to win the, in the, the whatever the kind of election they have, to, they have to deal with. That's the dilemma of the today's politicians they have to deal with. I think this is very unfortunate. This is actually tragic for today's politicians around the world. So not, it's not just mainland China or Taiwan. I think uh, politicians should really focus on conditions for reunification. The conditions are not the kind of terms or justifications for politicians. People have to really look, you know, what kind of conditions we need to create then we can have this peace available, long-term peace and the reunification available for the cross strait relationship. Right now, people are not creating relationship. Actually, for, the, for what the TPP is doing, whatever they're doing against like, the cross strait you know, the forum, they're destroying, destroying the you know, conditions. I think that's something we really have to wake up to looking at what's happening. Uh, Mr. He, you've been to Taiwan. You've met with some of the heavyweight politicians in the island. Can you brief us uh, with your first-hand account uh, concerning their feelings about the future of Taiwan? I think, uh, you know, I, I was very fortunate to, uh, to meet quite a few quite, you know, important people in Taiwan in recent you know, visits. A group of us, including some CEOs of uh, the technology company, you know, and some um, uh, academic people. And one thing really, again, I, I've been there for quite a few times. This, this really shows that um, I actually see that they really love the shared culture of both sides. The second thing is that uh, people actually starting to really value the potentials of both sides to work together. You know, one of the things that when we talk to the business executive, very, very important business executives in, in the Taiwan, so clear, Taiwan has a huge soft power, has a huge, you know, talent. 
especially for this outbound international economy, international trade. If mainland China, this is a huge the economic engine, can work with those huge talent in Taiwan, huge potentials. This is something I, I mean politicians should be, be fully aware. Huge potentials mm. come with uh, uncertainty, that's for sure. You're watching dialogue with uh, Mr. He Jing, attorney with Anjie Law Firm, Dr. Zhong Hu Tao with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and Professor Zheng Youping from the Taipei University. We're discussing uh, the latest uh, Streets Forum, an annual event across the Taiwan Street. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Once again, CGTN is joining with German broadcaster NDR in co-production, this time in Guangzhou. Hosts Yang Ray and Andreas Sitchewitz and an expert panel talk trade, technology, trust and the transformation of the Greater Bay Area as China and Germany look to restore some predictability to the world order. Join us for this lively conversation June 20th and 21st on Dialogue with the World here on CGTN. Yes, we do expect to look at dialogue with the world with the German counterparts that we conducted in Guangzhou. That's a very interesting special program. Please stay tuned. Uh, welcome back to our discussion about Taiwan. Now, younger generation in both Hong Kong and Taiwan should be the focus of our um, campaign to have, uh, you know, not only peaceful reunification across the streets, but also to ensure stability and prosperity of Hong Kong since uh, the takeover in or Hanover in 1997. Now, Dr. Zhong, uh, very quickly, uh, what should be done more to attract attention of younger generation in Taiwan? I think the Chinese mainland should build a more platform to attract uh, those young people from Taiwan. For example, we could provide more favorable or preferential policies for those uh, Taiwan young people to study, to work, and to create a new job, uh, to find a new job in Chinese mainland. And we provide some fund for them to begin a new work. And in this way, I think they could uh, become more willing to uh, work or study in Chinese mainland. Actually, we have really we have made a great achievement in this area. For example, in the last year, uh, more than 40,000 young people from Taiwan come to Chinese mainland for the first time. I think this uh, cause will become a great cause in the future. And another point I want to show you is that more than 55 of Taiwan young people, according to any public opinion poll, uh, shows that they are willing to uh, come to Chinese mainland. And now, as for now, uh, about 70% of the Taiwan young people who are working outside of Taiwan are now actually working in Chinese mainland and only about 30 of them working in the United States, in Japan, and some other areas. So you could find that the Chinese mainland is becoming a most attractive place for Taiwan young people. One more follow-up question, Dr. Zhong. Uh, some of the Taiwanese entrepreneurs and businessmen got the preferential treatment mm -hmm. and favorable conditions for making money in the mainland. However, when they go back to Taiwan, they cast their votes to support the DPP, the Green uh, Camp that supports the independence of Taiwan. Do you think the mainland would have that amount of patience and the political will to allow this to happen any longer? As for this question, I think it would be divided into parts. The first is that it is their own rights to vote for DPP or for KMT. That is their own rights. We should do uh, nothing for their rights. As for the second, we would not allow anyone to uh, bring benefit in Chinese mainland, to get benefit in Chinese mainland uh, on the one side. And on the other side, they, they, uh, be to, uh, they began to support the DPP when they came back to uh, Taiwan. I think they, if they do support DPP, maybe they have no chance to come back to Chinese mainland to earn money in future. What you suggest is the consequences arising exactly. from their uh, um, dubious and uh, yes. ambiguous maneuvers. Uh, let me go back to uh, Professor Zheng Youping from Taipei University. Uh, I'm not sure if the Chinese mainland authorities are that particular about the party affiliation of younger generation who have been attracted one way or another uh, working and living in mainland. But what do you think of the uh, chance for the younger generation uh, and the mainland authorities have been appealing to their mind and heart uh, 
in the hope that they can uh, stay away from uh, what they did, uh, for example, a few years ago in the Sunflower Movement. Um, it's a movement to show resentment against the ACFA policies, the uh, uh, trade services across the street. W what do you think uh, of the latest change in their mindset? I mean, the younger generation of Taiwanese people. Well, I teach in universities, and to be very frank, we are witnessing a gradual de-radicalization of the uh, college students uh, in Taiwan. In other words, uh, an increasing number of younger Taiwanese uh, college students has expressed, as uh, Ho Tao just mentioned, their willingness to come over to mainland China to work for exchanges or to uh, even uh, set up their own businesses. This is a sign of a turn toward a more pragmatic orientation. In other words, the younger generation college students in, in our, on our campuses are now beginning to realize that supporting DPP as they once did in the past didn't bring them any real benefits. Uh, their their uh, employment opportunity didn't rise as a result. Their salary uh, didn't come up. So, in, uh, so they're dis more or less disillusioned or disappointed in Tsai Ing-wen and DPP. So now they're turning toward uh, mainland China to find an, out, out, uh, an opportunity to, for themselves. In other words, they're trying to find a new stage for their future career. At the same time, when, DT, when DPP and Tsai Ing-wen are pushing for new softbound policies, and we notice that very few college Taiwanese students are willing to go over to so-called new softbound policies uh, uh, countries. And, and that goes to show you that these Taiwanese younger generations, they are not afraid of risks or, uh, uh, or any threats from TPP. They're only worried about the lack of opportunities. But mainland China does provide a land of opportunity for them. So we're looking at more and more Taiwanese students willing to come yeah. over <laughs> to mainland China. Uh, out of these several past surveys, over 50% of them show their willingness. And this is very interesting. Because if you look at DPP's efforts to try to brainwash these kids, DPP has suffered a severe, very serious setback in this regard. Uh, let, let's take a quick look at uh, what's going to happen uh, between Washington and Beijing. Because Taiwan has remained uh, the most sensitive core issue in the U.S.-China relationship. Professor Zheng. Uh, for the 2020 elections in the island of Taiwan, the DPP has nominated the current leader Tsai Ing-wen and the KMT announced five candidates for the primary. Uh, for the two parties, the issue of arms sales to Taiwan, the Taiwan Relations Act, with which Washington has made it very clear that they would not allow uh, the mainland to invade Taiwan to, have, uh, to liberate Taiwan. Um, uh, from uh, the pro-secession forces. Now, what do you think of the issue here uh, regarding Taipei and Washington? I will have to confess that uh, United States has really helped Tsai Ing-wen uh, a lot. But in terms of the votes that, that this effort can generate, I have to say that uh, it's marginal. It's not that useful. Even though the uh, United States, especially the Trump administration, obviously putting a lot of resources and trying to help Tsai Ing-wen to uh, consolidate her power position. Uh, I would say the Taiwanese people do realize that Taiwan is nothing but a pawn in the game. In other words, no matter what the Americans say openly, they realize that. It's not going to work in Taiwanese favor because we are just what the United States are using as a bargaining chip uh, in, its, uh, uh, in its game to, to, uh, to, uh, work, uh, to work against uh, mainland China. Uh, however, at the same time, I have to say that uh, Tsai Ing-wen is very skillful. She first recast the uh, electoral agenda in her primary election. 
So she demonized, demonized China. She demonized the one country, two system formula. And then she cried out that she wanted to protect Taiwan's democracy, freedom, and, and human rights. However, after she won the primary in DPP, she has now tried to move back to a more moderate position. We regret the fact that what we've just discussed, that the KMT candidates, no matter it's uh, Terry Guo or Han Guoyu, they took the bait and they followed Tsai Ing-wen's lead to reject the one country, two, uh, two systems formula, or to criticize Hong Kong and, and, and uh, the one country, two systems as, as a failure. I have to say that Tsai Ing-wen is very smart. DPP is very skillful at electioneering. Thank you but very much. KMT doesn't seem to realize that. Taking a strong stand is the best option. Thank you so much, Professor Zheng. Uh, Dr. Zhong and Mr. He, Washington has not only raised the level of a security dialogue and different kinds of exchanges between the uh, security authorities uh, in Taipei and Washington, but also wants to sell more arms. Uh, do you think this uh, threatens to violate the spirit of the Taiwan Relations Act and the August 17th document? Of course. According to both the, the so-called TI or Taiwan Relations Act and the three joint communique between Chinese mainland and the United States, it is clearly regulated that the United States should gradually reduce its arms sales to Taiwan. That means it's the amount and the weapons should become much uh, less and less. Um, but now the United States is preparing for more than 10 billion US dollars uh, arms sales to Taiwan, including the advanced jet fighter F-16V. Mr. He, are you pessimistic about the prospects of having very dangerous escalation of tensions between the Pentagon and the Chinese PLA armed forces over Taiwan? Uh, I'm not pessimistic. I think the, the key thing is for mainland China is to really resist the temptation to react. We must uh, keep the commitment to the peace and commitment, keep the commitment to the reunification. We have to really do what works. Dr. Zhang, uh, I noticed the recent remarks by Mr. John Allen, head of Brookings Institution, a very influential think tank in the D.C. He yes. said uh, the issue of Taiwan is easier to manage than the South China Sea. What did he mean? Uh, actually, I don't agree with his point. Uh, as for the South China, uh, South China Sea, uh, uh, I, I think no country would follow or cooperate with the United States. And since those countries are willing to make a balance between United States and China, so they want to make a good relationship with the Chinese mainland. But the deep Taiwan issue is different. The Taiwan Authority, I mean Taiwan Authority, could fully cooperate with the United States to take itself as a bargaining chip or as a pawn in a China and the U.S. game. So I think Taiwan issue would become much more dangerous than South China Sea issue. At the same time, Mr. John Allen warned mildly mm -hmm. authorities in Taiwan not to play fire uh, to uh, re revoke anger. That's a good the, uh, idea. Yes. Mainland. What did he mean? Uh, do you mean that Washington has been, uh, has been very watchful uh, that uh, hostilities uh, should hostilities break out, it won't serve the national interests of the United States. I think Alan uh, is meaning that he is very worried or concerned that Tsai Ing-wen could become a second word, uh, version of Chen Shui-bian or become a, much, uh, a troublemaker. I think uh, Tsai Ing-wen, if she become a troublemaker, then would be a great disaster for the peace and stability of uh, Taiwan Strait. Thank you so much. With that, we come to the end of this edition of Dialogue on Taiwan. I mean, the annual event of a streets forum, the 11th of its kind since its start. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.